Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 340, Climatology. I am Dr. Zach Hilgendorf, and today we're going to be talking about global systems of pressure and wind. This is leading off from our previous video where we talked about kind of just pressure and wind in general, what generates pressure, what drives pressure, and how wind is associated with that. So let's start actually with just a little bit of review. So let's first review our controls on global surface air temperature patterns. We talked about latitude and the influence of latitude because we think of latitude, eh, the incoming solar radiation or insulation generated by our sun that is intercepted by earth. Uh, those rays of the sun are traveling through different amounts of atmosphere at different angles encountering different things. So as insulation is coming into the earth, it is reflected or changed or altered. The areas of the most direct uh, insulation, we call the subsolar point, that's where the rays of the sun are coming in at 90 degrees. That only fluctuates between 23 and a half degrees north of the Tropic of Cancer and 23 and a half degrees south, the Tropic of Capricorn. So it's these variations that really start to drive thermal differences across our planet. They're also augmented by things like elevation. Uh, if we think of the Tibetan Plateau, you know, Mount Everest, we think of the Rockies, we think of um, some of the greater mountain chains, Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, or Mount Fuji. We see these differences in temperature uh, across there. That's why mountains are often snow-capped, right? There are land and water thermal contrasts. Water takes longer to heat up, but it also takes longer to release that heat. So water plays a moderating role on global uh, surface air temperatures. Ocean currents do as well. We're gonna save our talk uh, for that until uh, our next set of lectures where we really kind of pick apart what ocean currents are and how that drives uh, trends and, and climate across our world. And the one that's really important, atmospheric circulation patterns, and that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So next we're gonna kind of just touch on and recap briefly our atmospheric pressure and wind discussion from the last lecture. So pressure is just the average force per unit area exerted by the overlying atmosphere. It's greatest at sea level, about 1,013.25 millibars. Wind is just the horizontal expression of differences in atmospheric pressure. It's caused by things like differential heating of the atmosphere, as we just touched upon, and changes in speed and or direction of winds aloft. Forces that affect wind include the pressure gradient force, the friction force, which is working in opposition of the wind. Uh, the pressure gradient force, just to mention that too, is working perpendicular to the isobars that we see uh, on our pressure maps. And then the Coriolis force is the rotational force generated by our Earth that works uh, at a right angle to the direction of motion of winds. So let's take a look at that uh, using a couple of our examples from the last lecture. So here we can see in the case of low pressure systems, the pressure gradient force is uh, directed towards the center of the system of lowest pressure, while the Coriolis force uh, leads to the rotation and the system uh, the rotation of the system and the friction force opposes that movement. We generally see this as a counterclockwise rotating system, which we can see in this graphic here. So you've got converging winds on the surface, a low pressure system on the surface. You've got diverging winds, a high pressure system aloft. In high pressure systems, we see these winds deflected outward by the pressure gradient force in a clockwise direction. Here we see diverging winds on the surface, a high pressure system on the surface, and converging winds, a low pressure system aloft. And our world is incredibly dynamic. We can just see, uh, this is just kind of a quick gif here, to look at this kind of breathtaking uh, expression of moisture and cloud formation on our surface. We see low pressure systems, uh, we see kind of distinct differences between what's happening right along our equator and what's happening kind of in our mid latitudes. We see kind of this bright white line right towards the center of our planet. We'll get into what that is here in just a little bit. Um, but this just goes to show that there are so many things that impact and change pressure and wind in a global sense across our world. But there are some things that we can assume and some things that we can 
uh, kind of identify as being more consistent factors within uh, our Earth atmospheric circulation system. So we're going to start with global, uh, the global system of pressures and winds. And we're going to start here just looking at this map. This is a map of mean sea level pressure in January. Uh, we see some things here, the Aleutian Low, the Icelandic Low, the Bermuda, Azores High, Siberian High, kind of located north of this thing that's called the ITCZ. Bonus points if you can recall what that means from uh, your Intro to Physical Geography lectures or Geography 104 if you're at UW-Eau Claire. It's the Intertropical Convergence Zone. We'll dive into what that is here a little bit later. Um, but we can see, generally speaking, these are the average pressure systems for a given January. We see high pressure systems setting up uh, kind of in our mid-latitude areas, maybe around 30 degrees north and south. We see our low pressure systems kind of setting up uh, a little bit more poleward, uh, both in the north and the south hemisphere. Um, and we see kind of low pressure systems at the very, very center, right? Right along the equator or the ITCZ. So that's for January. But in uh, July, they look pretty different. We see kind of a, a reorganization. We see our Hawaiian high uh, kind of coming into play uh, and the Aleutian low kind of dissipating. We see a, Tibet, a Tibetan low starting to form. Um, we see our Bermuda Azores high is still kind of functioning where it is. But this just kind of goes to show that our world and our uh, atmospheric circulation system is incredibly dynamic. And a lot of it is driven, as we talked about, by these thermal differences and thermal development across our world that relate to our seasonal variations in thermal gradients. So there's a couple different uh, circulation models. Really, the first one that we'll talk about is, is dated. Uh, it was the original circulation model. We use the second one we'll be talking about. So the first one was our single cell circulation model. This was developed by George Hadley in 1735. The name might sound familiar to you. Uh, if you have recalling things from uh, Geography 104 or from previous exposures to weather and climate uh, data or facts. So this basically says that there is a large temperature contrast between the poles and the equator that creates a large convective cell in both hemispheres. So let's think about what that actually looks like. So let's think about the circulation in a room with a heater and a window. Uh, we see the heater in the bottom right corner, the window off to our left. There's a gradient in temperature there, right? If you're by the heater, it's going to be a lot warmer than if you were, say, over by the window. Well, warm air rises, right? We recall that from our last uh, lecture and from previous lectures. So warm air is less dense. It rises. It is driven towards maybe a low pressure system aloft. Once it cools down, that air descends and cycles back towards the low pressure system on the surface. Pretty much the same thing that we see with our equator being kind of the you know radiator here and the poles being our cold window. And here we can see what this single cell model looked like uh, developed by Hadley. We see the Hadley cell that name rings a bell. Uh, we see on the left graphic there kind of a temperature based uh, expression. So hot along the equator with a series of low pressure systems, uh, colder along the poles with a series of high pressure systems and that rising air at the equator descends uh, once it reaches the poles. And then kind of we have surface flow down primarily pull our equator word uh, in this example here. And we can kind of see a similar thing uh, just in more of a three-dimensional view on that image to the right. The one we really use is this three-cell circulation model. It was proposed in the 1920s to incorporate our better understanding of the rotational forces imparted by our spinning Earth. Uh, the Hadley cells are still included, but now they only pertain to the space between 30 and 60 degrees. Um, the feral cells were proposed by William Farrell to account for the westerly surface winds in the mid-latitudes. So this 
uh, is basically the circulation cell between 30 and 60 degrees north and south latitude. And the polar cell circulation is driven by subsidence near the poles that drives surface winds towards the equator. So this spins about 30 or 60 to 90 degrees north and south latitude. Here we can see an idealized diagram of this whole cycle. We can see the intertropical convergence zone, which hold tight, we'll get there. Uh, we see the Hadley cells. We see a low pressure system right along the equator and a high pressure system at 30 degrees north and south. That's kind of the extent of the Hadley cells. That low pressure system uh, is kind of working alongside the, uh, or that high pressure system, pardon me, along the feral cells working alongside the low pressure system uh, at 60 degrees north and south latitude. So these are kind of funneling cycles here. Uh, and then the polar cell and the polar highs uh, right at 90 degrees north and south latitude are kind of working and exchanging air with these low pressure cells uh, found around 60 degrees north and south. So let's go ahead and pick apart uh, the system to kind of better understand how it functions. And we're gonna start with the low latitudes here. So let's go ahead and walk through this diagram. So this is, uh, we're looking at the space between 30 degrees north to the left, 30 degrees south to our right, the equator right in the center. This is a side view of the troposphere for our low latitude areas. Let's ignore the fact that we don't see the curvature of the earth here, just for simplicity's sake. So right along the equator, we have warmer air, right? We're constantly heating that area. Uh, it's the area where we receive the most net radiation. So let's go ahead and sketch out 500 millibars here. We can see it's a bit higher uh, in the equator area, right? That area is less dense. So by to get to 500 millibars, you need more atmosphere. Same thing for 300 millibars, but a little more pronounced. So what we have setting up in winds and pressure aloft is a high pressure cell uh, at 300 millibars over the equator and associated low pressure cells around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. So these are aloft. Pay attention to that particular part here. So we need to have that uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. So we are having pressure moving uh, from high to low, right, to kind of equilibrate that pressure uh, di differential. At the surface, we're left with a surface low pressure system. So that's where we see that low pressure system that we saw along the equator. That's what we're seeing here. That means that at the surface around 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north, we need to have high pressure systems. So you can kind of see how this, this circulation cell is starting to develop. And we can see low pressure air or colder air descending uh, around 30 degrees north and south to the fill in that high pressure uh, or to, sorry, to generate that high pressure system at the surface. These are what we refer to as our subtropical highs. And then we flow back in to the center because we need to uh, fill in that pressure void. So we also have these things called the trade winds. And these trade winds are driven by the equator word flow that is deflected by our Coriolis force. And they're so-called because they actually enabled early shipping and early uh, sailors to kind of ship goods and move goods between Europe and North America. In the Northern hemisphere, they blow from the Northeast, while in the Southern hemisphere, they blow from the southeast. They converge near the equator in a region that has a very weak pressure gradient. This zone is referred to as the doldrums, where light, uh, light winds and humid conditions provide kind of monotonous weather. The intertropical convergence zone refers to the low pressure zone where the trade winds converge. It's doldrums, intertropical convergence zone, kind of similar here. And we'll see in some uh, pictures later on, it's the zone right along the equator where you see kind of consistent cloud cover. And then our 
warming air at the center is rising and we have this complete circulation here. We refer to this cycle as the Hadley cell or Hadley cells from the North and the South hemisphere. So we can see here, uh, kind of a, looking back to one of our three dimensional views that we saw in a previous slide. So to kind of talk about this a little bit more, we've got this warm air rising at the equator uh, that releases latent heat. We talked about latent heat previously uh, during the formation of these huge cumulus clouds. And we'll talk about cloud formation a little bit down the road in part three, but it's thought to provide energy to drive this Hadley cell circulation. So as upper level airflow moves away from these stormy equatorial regions, radiation cooling dominates. And then we've got this Coriolis force that strengthens with distance from the poles, or sorry, from the equator. So we have this poleward moving upper air, this kind of air aloft being deflected into nearly west to east flow by the time it reaches about 30 degrees. Kind of makes sense we're seeing. So what we're seeing here is kind of a reflection of surface winds, but this isn't showing necessarily winds aloft. So pay attention when we're talking about kind of winds aloft, it's not what we're seeing on this graphic here. Um, but because of those that Coriolis effect, we're kind of restricting the flow or the poleward flow of winds by the time we hit about 30 degrees uh, latitude. So the air subsides between about 20 degrees and 35 degrees latitude because it's relative to, uh, and is relatively dry because much of the moisture was released by this cumulus cloud development near the equator. Throw in adiabatic heating as air is descending or adiabatic warming, uh, which we'll talk about when we get into atmospheric moisture, we're drying the air even more. And this actually lines up with some of the major deserts of the world. We jump to our good old Keppen climate uh, regional map here, right about 30 degrees north and south latitude, we see those BWH through BSK uh, climates starting to show up, right? These really, really dry climates where our major deserts, the Sahara, um, the Atacama, the Australian deserts really show up. And we can even see our own a uh, little bit higher up maybe, but uh, we can see our own deserts in the Southwest kind of popping up here as well. So let's kind of look at this from a different perspective. Looking top down on the earth from above the North Pole, we can see our equator here, roughly 40,100 kilometers in circumference. By the time we get to 30 degrees north latitude, we get to about 34,700 degree uh, kilometers in circumference. So if this was wind blowing in the surface, we've got kind of this Coriolis effect deflecting winds, right? So we see winds are not necessarily going to be coming straight pressure gradient is pushing them that way. But they're being deflected by the Coriolis effect kind of towards the uh, towards the east. What we get here is our subtropical jet stream. So this is one of the two jet streams we're going to be talking about today. So Let's jump back to this here and let's add a little bit more. So here we can see our North and South Hemisphere subtropical jet streams. We see our North, East and Southeast trade winds down below here. And then it is something we should note that as we're kind of having this cycle within the uh, Hadley cells, we're having some air kind of descending here on both sides, kind of funneling in this is kind of this big circulation system, right? Well, what we end up getting is this kind of trade wind inversion. And a trade wind inversion just refers to a characteristic temperature inversion that's usually present in the trade winds uh, and the trade wind streams over the eastern portions of the tropical oceans. 
It's found in large scale subsiding flows uh, constituting the kind of descent branches of our Hadley cells. So the descent branches being the ones on either end of the slide, uh, kind of coming down from uh, those low pressure systems in the upper corners here. Now let's go ahead and jump to our mid and high latitudes. So this one, uh, have another one. This is a side view of our troposphere in the mid and high latitudes. Going from 30 degrees, so kind of the edge of the cells that we were just looking at, all the way up to 90 degrees. Uh, and this is, take this for both uh, the north and the south hemisphere. So there's our subtropical high, as we saw before. Sketch these back in. There's our subtropical jet stream. We've got this low pressure system aloft feeding into and funneling into a high pressure system uh, as that cold air is descending, kind of developing this high pressure system on the surface. So we have diverging air here at the surface, right, instead of converging air. And we have this kind of west, what we call the westerlies. As we move closer towards the uh, mid to upper latitudes, we kind of get this polar front. You can have that in there. So we have a high pressure system situated right at the poles. So at 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south, we have this kind of polar high pressure system. We call that the polar high. So we've got high pressure at the surface in both uh, our 90 degrees and both at 30 degrees. These are what we would call the polar easterlies. Um, so this circulation uh, in the polar cell is driven by kind of subsiding air near the poles that produces surface flow that's moving towards the equator. We call these polar easterlies. So as that cold air moves towards the equator, it eventually encounters uh, the warmer westerlies. Uh, and what you have is kind of a region where the flow of cold air clashes with the uh, flow of warm air. That's this polar front that we're seeing here, uh, which is where the most prevalent stream, get up here quick, we can kind of see this, that's the front that we're talking about. So, <laughs> sorry, I got a little animation happy here. This is that most prevalent jet that, jet that we're talking about. This is the polar jet stream. Um, as the polar jet moves towards the equator in the winter months, it can bring kind of this cold air in like these deep plunging troughs of the jet. Uh, you may recall from a number of years back, the, uh, the polar jet or the polar vortex, pardon me. Uh, this was caused by kind of a polar jet that had been relatively entrenched for a period of time, bringing this Arctic air just blasting down from uh, kind of upper Canada. So within this polar front, you've got kind of a low pressure system. So this kind of completes kind of this, these cycles, these cells that are moving uh, air and funneling air through these various pressure systems from the equator up all the way through the poles. We call this particular area our subpolar low. So let's go ahead and kind of put this all together looking at Earth. So you see that band of white located just at the north tip of South America? Right there. So here we can see our trade winds. We can see uh, these surface winds funneling towards that white band. We see winds aloft diverging from that area. That's our intertropical convergence zone. That's what I was talking about. So you can always kind of see it noted by this band of white clouds uh, across the surface uh, along the equator. We've got that warm air rising. So as that air is funneling through, we can see our subtropical highs up top. 
uh, about 30 degrees north and south. And as that cold air starts to descend, you can kind of see it building up on the surface. Those are our, our 30 degrees north and south high pressure systems to complement the low pressure system along the intertropical convergence zone. Moving up it's from about 30 up to about 60, you've got our easterlies and our westerlies. You see our polar highs uh, right along the caps there. Funneling air out, so kind of down in latitude. There's our polar front in both the north and the south hemisphere. And it's kind of forming kind of a cycle of air that's moving across uh, kind of the poleward regions of our planet. And it functions and it moves kind of like this gigantic river, if you want to think of it that way, um, kind of as an atmospheric river. So it can meander, it can change position, it can become entrenched uh, if the pressure systems are set up right. Um, but really it's kind of this dynamic system that is driven by these thermal changes across our planet. They also form these low pressure systems. So now we're going to move on to kind of these semi-permanent systems. Uh, we've got this and we're going to touch back on our jet streams in a little bit more depth. Um, so here in January, you might remember a similar map from previously. We can see our Siberian high uh, over Russia and Siberia over there. The Aleutian Low set up over uh, the east edge of Russia, near Alaska, kind of set up over the Aleutian Peninsula. We see our Canadian High and our Pacific High. We see our Icelandic Low, our Bermuda High. So these are more or less typical systems that we can expect will set up during the winter months here in the Northern Hemisphere. So we see these low pressure systems primarily setting up over bodies of water for the most part, these high pressure systems are typically setting up over uh, cold uh, portions of kind of land masses here, right? So we see the Siberian high, the Canadian high, uh, that Bermuda high, not so much, um, but we can kind of see how these set up and form throughout the year. Now let's take a look at what winds aloft look like at, in January. Here we can see kind of a similar thing. We see kind of this focused high pressure system at 500 millibars. Uh, these are our streamlines and isotherms here in January. So that high pressure system complements the low pressure system down on the surface, the intertropical convergence zone. Uh, we see this low pressure system up in the northern uh, portions of the map here, kind of poleward, which is set up along where that polar jet is. So here they are again in Jan uh, July, pardon me. We see a couple different things here. We've got kind of this Pacific high kind of really starting to expand and, and impact weather and climate. We see this thermal low setting up uh, kind of in the basin and range area where we have this kind of really, really hot land mass uh, that's driving low pressure systems here because if we recall hot air rises on the surface, we see this low pressure system that will set up. Uh, the Bermuda high and the Icelandic low have kind of shifted a little bit. We see another low setting up over the Middle East, kind of so, again, where these really, really warm portions of our planet exist. Let's go ahead and look aloft for these ones. Here we can see the 500 millibars in July. We see that that high pressure zone has shifted north a little bit relative to where it was in January as the intertropical convergence zone has also shifted north, right? So this is a seasonal relationship that develops and builds. And a lot of it can be driven by these winds a lot, what we would call our jet stream, right? So the jet stream, there are two primary jet streams that we're interested in. We've got the 
subtropical and the polar jet. So jet streams are really just relatively narrow bands of, of strong winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Winds blow from west to east in jet streams, but the flow often shifts from north to south. So think of those zonal and meridional winds that we talked about in our last uh, lecture. That's what we're talking about here. So jet streams follow the boundaries between hot and cold air. So kind of these convergence zones in our upper atmosphere or these divergence zones in our upper atmosphere. Uh, so the jet streams are the strongest for both north and south or for the northern and southern hemisphere in winters. So since these hot and cold air boundaries are most pronounced in winter, that's when these jet streams are strongest. The actual appearance of the jet streams results from the kind of these complex interactions between a lot of these different variables that we talked about, kind of those semi-permanent air systems, these thermal gradients that we see developing, uh, seasonal changes, and they meander around the globe, dipping and rising in altitude and latitude. Sometimes they split, uh, they'll form eddies, they'll get entrenched, they might disappear, they might appear somewhere else. They're kind of very dynamic in, in how they change. So these jet streams also follow the sun in that as the sun's elevation increases each day in the spring, the average latitude of the jet stream shifts poleward. By summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's typically found near the US-Canada border. As autumn approaches, uh, the sun's elevation decreases and the jet stream's average latitude moves towards the equator. So let's go ahead and take a picture or take a look at, you know, just a, a couple slides here of what that looks like. So here we can see just this kind of rotating or moving GIF here uh, where we see uh, this is from March. Uh, so right around spring. So we can kind of see here, uh, this is a view looking uh, actually kind of at the Aleutian low here. Um, we can see this, the Aleutian low has kind of caused the jet stream to almost split, if you will. Uh, you see part of it shifting north, but you see some of that wind being pulled down towards the south, or kind of at the south edge of the that low pressure system that you see there. Um, and then you see it's kind of currently right around the Canadian Alaskan borders where it looks like the majority of this jet stream is sitting. So just as a quick recap, we talked about these different circulation models. We talked about the low, mid and high latitude trends. And then we talked about the semi-permanent pressure systems that set up over our world. And then finally, we talked about kind of the polar and subtropical jet stream and what they do and how they set up. So I hope this video made sense. Uh, I will be posting the next ones, focusing on ocean circulations and uh, ocean trends, things like El Nino, La Nina cycles, the Pacific decadal oscillation, and these broader climatological trends related to ocean circulation. So that's where we're gonna go in the next video. Um, and then we'll dive into moisture after that. So we will see you in the next one and I hope you have a great day. Bye.